Today's scripture reading is chapter 3 of the book of Ruth, which you can find in your pew Bibles on page 243. This would be a great day to follow along as we go through it so that you can make absolutely certain that your pastor isn't making things up. Just as I have for the past two weeks, I will, uh, since it's a long scripture passage, intersperse the reading of the passage with the sermon and the story as we go. So as we prepare to hear God's word to us this morning, let us pray. Lord, you have taught us in the scriptures that the grass withers and the flower fades, but your word endures forever. Now may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. I feel like I need to give you an extra warning today. Chapter 3 of the book of Ruth should be rated at least PG-13, if not rated R. If you haven't figured it out yet, Ruth is a love story. It is a biblical romance story. And often, in a romantic movie or a romantic story, things can get a little steamy. Today's passage is like that. Of course, most of the English translations of the book of Ruth try to hide this a bit or tone it down a little bit through the use of euphemism, but it's there, and it's there for good reason. So I'm not going to dance around it today. I'm just going to preach it like it is. There is still plenty of time to send your children to the playground if you're worried, or if you're really nervous, you can join them there yourself. They'll still get a Bible story. You'll still get a Bible story out there. I was going to say something about all of our teenagers usually check out anyhow, but um, somehow they decided to stick around today. I wonder why. <laughs> all right, first, let's recap the last two weeks, the last two chapters of the book of Ruth. Naomi and her daughter-in-law, Ruth, are both widows. Their husbands died in the land of Moab, making them destitute, and so they have returned to Naomi's home country of Judah, where Ruth has been working in the field of a man named Boaz. Boaz, though presumably much older than Ruth, has shown great kindness to her. And just last week, we learned that he's actually a close relative of Naomi's deceased husband, Elimelech. We're going to jump right in. Chapter 3, verse 1. Naomi, her mother-in-law, said to her, that is Ruth, my daughter, I need to seek some security for you, so that it may be well with you. Now, here is our kinsman Boaz, with whose young women you have been working. See, he is winnowing barley tonight at the threshing floor. For those not familiar with what winnowing barley is, it's how you take the stalks of wheat and basically turn them into usable grain. Uh, you take the stalks to the threshing floor, which would have been a hard surface outdoors, and you put them on the ground and either let the animals stomp on them or else you beat them with a stick so that the pieces of grain will separate from the rest of the stalk. And then at that point, you throw everything up in the air, and the wind carries away the lighter stalk while the grains fall to the ground. So that's the process of threshing. Now you know and... What a romantic setting the threshing room floor can be. Naomi continues. He's winnowing barley tonight at the threshing floor. Now wash and anoint yourself and put on your best clothes and go down to the threshing floor. But do not make yourself known to the man until he is finished eating and drinking. When he lies down, observe the place where he lies. Then go and uncover his feet and lie down, and he will tell you what to do. She said to her, all that you tell me, I will do. So, nothing like a little bit of stalking to get the relationship going. That's a joke, stalking stalks of wheat, stalk, beating the stalk. <sighs> Although, it does seem like Naomi is coaching Ruth in the art of a more traditional kind of stalking, too. Ruth is instructed to put on her best clothes, state night, to anoint herself with oil. That would be the modern-day equivalent of wearing perfume. 
But what's really interesting here is that Naomi tells Ruth to wait until Boaz is asleep and then to uncover his feet and lie down. Why would you uncover someone's feet in the middle of the night? Better yet, why would a man sleeping outside in the hot Middle Eastern sun be covering his feet at night at all? It doesn't make a whole lot of sense unless feet aren't really feet. In several places in the Old Testament, as well as throughout Jewish rabbinic literature, feet are often, not always, but often a euphemism for the male reproductive organ. If you read the story that way, it actually starts to make a whole lot more sense and will be more familiar to those of you who watch a fair amount of romantic movies or read romantic novels, if you're willing to admit that. Verse 6. So she went down to the threshing floor and did just as her mother-in-law had instructed her. When Boaz had eaten and drunk and he was in a contented mood, he went to lie down at the end of the heap of grain. Then she came stealthily and uncovered his feet and lay down. At midnight, and you got to wonder why it takes so long here, but remember Boaz is a little bit older. At midnight, the man was startled and turned over, and there lying at his feet was a woman. Now, when the NRSV says, and there, lying at his feet, that phrase, and there, is not really the words for and there in uh, Hebrew. It's actually my favorite Hebrew word of all, hine, which older versions of the Bible usually translate as lo or behold. But I prefer Thomas Cahill's translation of this word. He uses the modern day acronym WTF because that's probably what Boaz actually was thinking. WTF, there's a woman there. Verse 9, and you have to love the awkwardness and the comedy that's inherent in Boaz's response. He said, uh, who are you? And she answered, I am Ruth, your servant. Spread your cloak over your servant, for you are next of kin. And bam, things go from awkward to really serious in just a few words. In a simple and direct way, Ruth lays everything on the table. And I mean that literally as well as figuratively. Spread your cloak over your servant. For a man to spread his cloak over a woman, covering her nakedness in the act of intercourse, is in the ancient Middle East essentially a marriage proposal. So Ruth is saying to Boaz, propose to me. But it's more than that. The actual language that she uses, which gets lost a little bit in the translation, is a beautiful metaphor. It's similar language to what we saw just a few chapters ago when they first met. And Boaz prayed that God might spread his wings over Ruth to shelter her and protect her. And that's the language that Ruth is now using to Boaz. It's almost as if she's saying, why don't you make that prayer come true? Why don't you act on God's behalf to make it so? But there's still even more. Spread your cloak over your servant, for you are next of kin. Now, in our culture, in our language, next of kin is not exactly a positive thing. It's, what we, it's the name of the person that we put down on the form so that they know who to notify if something really bad happens to you. That's your next of kin. That's the best that the New Revised Standard Version could do to translate a Hebrew word for which there really is no good equivalent. The Hebrew word is goel. And the goel literally is a redeemer, a rescuer. But we have seen this concept before in the previous chapters and in the Old Testament law. This is the relative of the deceased husband who was required by law to marry the widow and therefore carry on the family line to rescue or redeem the family line. 
So not only is Ruth saying, propose to me, Boaz, she's saying, you must propose to me, Boaz. It's your duty. Don't let anyone ever tell you that women in the Bible are weak, passive, timid, or submissive. Ruth is clearly in charge of the situation. She is bold in her actions. She is clever in her words. And along with her mother-in-law, Naomi, they have made a very smart plan to work for their good and the good of the community. But Ruth here has also taken a great risk. She's out on a limb right now. She's vulnerable. And perhaps she's wondering if she's a little bit out of her league, too. I can assure you, she is not. Verse 10, Boaz said, May you be blessed by the Lord, my daughter. This last instance of your loyalty is better than the first. You have not gone after young men, whether poor or rich. And here we learn as a fact, something that we have suspected all along. Boaz is indeed significantly older than Ruth. And it seems like he expected that she would have sought out a husband who was her own age and is a little bit surprised that she is seeking him out instead. When Boaz refers to Ruth's first loyalty, he means her faithfulness to her mother-in-law, Naomi. But when he praises even more this last instance of your loyalty, he's not actually talking about any benefit to himself. Boaz quickly realizes something in the moment. He realizes that if Ruth had gone after a young but poor man, she would not have been able to take care of her mother-in-law, Naomi, let alone herself. If, on the other hand, Ruth had gone after a young rich man, her mother-in-law would probably do just fine, but the name and lineage of her deceased husband would fall into obscurity forever. This is what Boaz realizes about Ruth. Her first loyalty is to Naomi, but her last loyalty, her greater, greater loyalty is to the family of Naomi and her husband and their sons, which also happens to be the family of Boaz. Verse 11, and now, my daughter, do not be afraid. I will do for you all that you ask. For all the assembly of my people, in other words, that family that you have just demonstrated your loyalty to, all of the assembly of my people know that you are a worthy woman. But now, Though it is true that I am a near kinsman, there is another kinsman more closely related than I. Remain this night, and in the morning, if he will act as next of kin for you, good, let him do it. If he is not willing to act as next, to, next of kin for you, then as the Lord lives, I will act as next of kin for you. Lie down until the morning. In saying this, Boaz shows honor for the traditions of his people. He shows respect for his relative who has the stronger claim, and he shows honesty and transparency to Ruth, who is depending on him in this moment. Verse 14. So she lay at his feet until morning, but got up before one person could recognize another. For he said, it must not be known that the woman came to the threshing floor. Some things haven't changed in thousands and thousands of years. Boaz here is protecting Ruth from the walk of shame, from the rumor mill, from the gossip column, and probably protecting himself, too. Verse 15, Then he said, Bring the cloak you are wearing and hold it out. So she held it, and he measured out six measures of barley and put it on her back. Then he went into the city. She came home to her mother-in-law who said, how did things go with you, my daughter? Then she told her all that the man had done for her, saying, he gave me these six measures of barley, for he said, do not go back to your mother-in-law empty-handed. She 
she replied, wait, my daughter, until you learn how the matter turns out. For the man will not rest, but will settle the matter today. And I love that image of Boaz that Naomi paints there. When Boaz has decided on a course of action, he will not rest until things are settled. Well, next week, we will find out just how things settle out. We'll find out how the story ends and if the other kinsman redeemer stronger claim prevails. But since today was what they call in the film industry our meet cute, right? That's, that's a funny and awkward but cute and beautiful beginning of a legendary relationship. Since that's where we are today, I thought we would end by maybe covering a few relationship principles that we can glean from this story. Here's the first one. Some things in relationships are not really that important, though they may seem to be. On the surface, it would seem like Ruth and Boaz are completely incompatible. They have nothing in common. They come from two entirely different countries and cultures. They come from different socioeconomic classes. They even come from two entirely separate generations. And yet, far from dividing them, these differences seem to work in their favor. There is definitely chemistry between them. By the way, that's another great euphemism, chemistry. But even here, with each other, their approach is quite different. One is cautious, while the other is bold. We have no description of their physical appearances, but in any case, they don't seem to focus much on that or talk about that with each other. And so compatibility for Ruth and Boaz looks completely different than all of the things we have been taught by our culture, by our movies, by our stories to look for in another person. Which leads me to the second principle. While some things are not that important in a relationship, some things are very important. And they aren't the things that we've been taught to believe. They aren't the things that we might expect. They aren't surface level things. They are the deeper things. The core values and beliefs that connect us to each other and to God. It is obvious that here where it counts the most, Ruth and Boaz are on the same wavelength. They both intensely value loyalty to their family. They both always make it a point to show kindness and respect to others, even strangers. They both share the same faith in the God of Israel, which Ruth adopted when she came to Israel with her mother-in-law. And they both show honor for the customs and the traditions of the land they find themselves in. What's more, they recognize and acknowledge these things in each other, often pointing them out and praising each other for those values. Some things are important. Some things are not so important. May we learn to discern which those things are and put our trust and base our relationships on those deeper things, those values and those beliefs, which are truly important to us and to God. One more principle. The title of this sermon series is Redeeming Love, the story of Ruth. And the whole story, as we're learning, centers around this idea of the Goel, the kinsman redeemer. I'm going to talk a lot about that concept next week, but for now, as far as it relates to relationship principles, we might say this is one. Love is powerful precisely because it has the power to redeem, to rescue, to revalue the things that the world has rejected and thrown away. A widowed mother-in-law, a foreign outcast, an old man. When we see others the way God sees them, when we love others the way God loves them, when we treat other people the way God wants us to treat them, then and only then we discover a whole new ecosystem of value inherent 
in the people around us and within ourselves. Yes, you may be an outcast. Yes, you may be poor or too old or too young or whatever label the world bestows upon you in order to put you in your place. But that is just at the surface level, at the very core of your being. You are fundamentally a beloved child of God, created with infinite dignity and worth. We have been redeemed from this world. We have been rescued and revalued by God's love. And so in your most intimate relationships, and really in all of your relationships, always try to help each other seek and find and pursue that kind of redeeming, revaluing, rescuing love, which is the love of God. Let us pray. Lord, what a gift it is that you have given us in creating us to be in relationship with other people. Lord, in all of our relationships, but especially the most intimate ones, give us the courage and the strength to overcome those differences which are not really so significant, the things that don't matter that the world tells us should matter. Give us wisdom and give us discernment, give us judgment to seek out in our partners, in our spouses, in our friends, those deeper values, the ones that are important to you, and help us to make those the bedrock of our relationships. Lord, we pray all of these things just as you have taught us to pray, and we say together, our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive our debts as we forgive our debtors. Save us from the time of trial and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours now and forever. Amen. Mm.